Project Egg Show. I'm your host, Ben Gothard, and today we have the honor of speaking with Mr. Peter Montoya. How are you doing today, Peter? Great, Ben. Thanks so much for having me on. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I'm so glad and excited to chat with you today uh, because I really want to ask you, what is your story? <laughs> uh, I've had a, a long, uh, challenged story. Uh, grew up in Pasadena, was the oldest of um, five boys. Uh, John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke were raised Catholic. Uh, went to school at the University of California, Ir Irvine, and uh, graduated with a degree in political science. Uh, my um, mother really wanted me to be a politician. I just didn't have the ambition um, or sex drive for politics. So uh, with a degree in political science, you've only got a couple of choices, and that is uh, law school, um, food services, you can become a bartender or a waiter, um, or sales. And uh, I went to work for the uh, biggest motivational speaker in, in the world straight out of college. Uh, I was in sales, traveling around the country for uh, three or four years, and learned how to become a um, speaker, uh, largely in sales and motivation. Then moved on to uh, marketing and branding. I wrote uh, several books around personal branding. The best known one was The Brand Called You. Started an advertising agency specializing in marketing and branding for financial service professionals, uh, and then transformed it into a software company, uh, and then sold that in 2018. And now I am pursuing uh, my purpose, uh, which is to help people transform while building better community and hopefully making a, a positive impact, uh, impact on the planet. So how did you discover that that was your purpose? I think I've always been drawn to it. Uh, I think that I've always gotten, ever, ever since I first got involved with personal development when I was 19 years old, 18 years old, excuse me, uh, I really got excited by seeing people transform. Uh, of course, being a person transformation uh, and then being around people who are transforming and then later leading people uh, through personal transformation has always been a real thrill for me. But transformation by itself is kind of worthless unless you're actually doing something with it. So unless you're improving your life, the lives of the people around you and or humanity, it's kind of a waste of money. So transformation just for the sake of transformation, not enough. Probably not. Not considering uh, the challenges that we as a species are facing right now. We really just don't have the time to just kind of be in and just kind of be right now. So it's like it's more of like a survival like a biological imperative to survive more than like a, like a moral or, or ethical responsibility? Well, I think you probably could say that. I would say, all right, we have a moral imperative to survive, to make sure that we're leaving a planet uh, onto our children, which is at least as good or better than we found it. And I think that we're probably headed on a path not to do that right now. So I don't really think we have the luxury uh, as a species right now uh, to just kind of navel gaze and, and contemplate our existence. We don't have that luxury right now. So what does that transformation actually look like or what has it looked like for you specifically? I mean, did you just read a lot of books? Did you ask yourself hard questions? Did you journal? Did you do, you know, what did that process actually look like for you? Oh, that's a, that's a great question, Ben. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I went through my first personal development course when I was 18 years old and I absolutely hated it. I mean, I sat in the back of the room, gritting my teeth, grinding my teeth, uh, having a uh, in-head argument with the facilitator every single step of the way. I resisted it completely. Uh, and it wasn't until about a year later that I finally uh, reduced my anger enough that I was reflecting upon it, that I realized that there's some pretty good stuff in that, in that course. So I went back and read the course again, this time with an open mind, which is pretty critical if you actually wanna grow and learn. Uh, and then I kind of began my journey. And since that, since then, I've attended at least one, if not two, personal or professional development courses every single year for the last 30 years. And it has transformed uh, my life. And I'd like to think the lives of the people who are around me as well. In addition to that, uh, I'm an avid reader uh, and I've become a complete and total podcast junkie. Uh, I think the podcasts in the last two years of my life have given me a, a, a second uh, bachelor's degree. Uh, just by listening to podcasts every single day for a couple hours. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of the podcast medium. Uh, I journal a lot. I'm also a, a fairly deep thinker. I think about the hard questions on a regular basis. So I think my life is uh, 
has an, is undergirded by a, a philosophy and a practice of personal development. Well, first of all, rock on with the podcasts. Hell yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Um, I love podcasts, obviously. So it's uh, I love when when other people have that same passion for podcasts because so many people put in so much time and effort into creating incredible content. Mm -hmm. And actually, most of it goes unnoticed. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, I, I love to hear uh, that that fellow podcasters and fellow uh, lovers of, of podcasting are out there. And, and I love talking to them. Um, I, I couldn't agree more because they're right. They're, they're, part of, they're putting incredible efforts into the content. And number two, it's free by and large. They're starting to charge now for ads and find different ways to monetize podcasts. But it's by and large, still free. And the third you know, there's a, an amazing intimacy between a podcast host guest and uh, the receiver. So as someone's listening to this, um, you know, in their car, I, I listen to a lot in bed as I'm going to sleep. There is a connection unlike any other medium because it almost feels like those voices are in your, inside your head. So it's very, very intimate. And to me, it helps me learn faster than maybe any other modality. That's amazing. Is, is it the conversation that really sticks with you or like a, what about what about the actual podcast is is so helpful for for your learning uh, so i listen to all types of formats of podcasts uh, i love conversations like the one that uh Ezra Klein and Sam Harris and Joe Rogan have. They're amazing conversationalists and you can tease out some wonderful information. I also like call-in shows. Uh, I even like some call-in shows where the hosts argue uh, with, with the guests. I learned, my, I learned logic that way. And then I also love the uh, documentary style, uh, the drama style. Uh, so any of those formats uh, can work really well for transferring information. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell's podcast is mind-blowingly good it is written so incredibly well uh, if you're not listening to revisionist history uh go pick that one up right away it is absolutely um, a gem and even if you don't like the content just to hear how he puts them together how he weaves together a story is absolutely masterful yeah i, I couldn't agree more with it because Putting together that story and making it both entertaining, but also giving people something that that they can take away from it, that is a truly a work of art. I mean, I, I really feel like a lot of podcasts are, are artists first and foremost, mm -hmm. and podcasting is is just a medium. So I'm curious as you're as you're reading and you're going to these courses and conferences and listening to podcasts and and, and whatnot, how do you retain? all the information because I, I know personally I read constantly. I mean, I, I read for hours every single day. And one of the biggest struggles that I have is actually retaining everything that I read. And it got to the point where I even started a, I even started like a, a podcast that I don't market at all. I don't do anything with it just to challenge myself to, um, be able to teach some of the key lessons from the books that I read just to make sure I'm absolutely comprehending as, as, as much as I possibly can. So how do you actually go about uh, retaining all that information? Ben, you just asked a, a million dollar question. I'm going to give you probably the best idea you have gotten from any podcast that you've personally done in the last year. So uh, that's a I high have, bar, my friend. I, I tell you, <laughs> this is really, really a good idea. So uh, I use Google Sheets, but you also could use Excel. And in Google Sheet, I have a folder called Peter Content Development. And in here, in this sheet, I put all of the ideas that I hear and I read on a regular basis. So every single day, I am in this massive Google Sheet. There are different tabs. I think I've got 10 different tabs through here. Uh, and each tab is a different category of content. So one tab is called articles. And whenever I read an article that's really helpful and useful, I will go and put that article actually in this tab. It has the date, the topic, uh, the type, the headline, and the link. I have another one called podcasts. And when I'm listening to a podcast, it's a really good idea. I put it in there. The date I added it, the topic, the title. Uh, I put the link, and also I'll put in there the timestamp for whatever it might be and the notes. I've got other tabs uh, for my personal stories. I'm a speaker and trainer. So every single day I'm trying to develop a new story that I can tell. Uh, whatever, you know, you might be out to the grocery store, you might get cut off, you might have a phone call with a family or 
family or friend and you have those aha moments, I put those stories in there. Uh, I have quotes that I like. Uh, I have uh, competitors that I want to keep an eye on. I have the personal development exercises that I like in there. So I'm constantly developing this massive spreadsheet uh, with different tabs that helps me categorize all the content I want. So whenever I'm working on a book or working on a speech, sometimes I have a memory and inkling of what I might need, or I can just go through and look at the topics or the headlines and find the content that I sourced. So you're basically going through and as you are downloading this information, whatever happens to be, you know, significant enough to really stick out, then you document it into this spreadsheet with, with time, date, link, timestamps, et cetera, and, and a note on like what it actually is, right? Yeah. That's cool. I, I really it was, like it was, that. It was a million dollar idea. I told you it was the best idea you got all year. <laughs> the high bar. So how, when you're like, let's say you're reading a book, right? And let's say it's just a gem. I mean, an absolute gem of a book. Do you, will you write multiple notes for yeah. that one book? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of times I'll use the noting feature in Amazon uh, and I'll use create little blurbs about it um, in the books tab and then link back to those notes uh, in the book. Uh, sometimes I'll take a picture of it uh, in the, of the book and then actually you can put pictures back into the sheet. So there's all sorts of little techniques to do that. That's awesome. So you're building like you're building like a virtual representation of what you believe and hold to be true and like the ideas that you most like like these are your these are the ideas of, of other people that, that you really enjoyed and, and have liked. Yeah. So more or less what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to pursue the best explanation for reality. Uh, so I'm trying to understand reality as best I possibly can. I am studying what's called nature, uh, and I'm creating a document that helps me understand it. What I'm looking for, which I think is what most people are looking for, is I want to create predictable models. So I want to create a model so I know if I do X um, and Y and Z, then I'm going to get uh, the result that I want as often as possible, which is really hard because the world's getting increasingly more complicated. But yeah, almost anything you want to do Someone out there already has created a predictable model uh, to help you achieve it. So why is it so important? And it, it may be obvious to you, but I, and I have an inkling of what the answer might be, but I just want to ask you directly. Why is it so important for you to want to understand reality? Like, why is that the, the core of, of like what you're going about trying to do? So let me, uh, I'll take a, one step back and I'm broadening it a little bit, and we'll talk a little bit mo about morality, which is kind of a, a heavy topic for most people. So um, I believe that the goal of morality is subjective. It's up for each person to decide uh, what morality is, what is right and wrong. So some people might say that their morality comes from God or the Bible. They might say, if God says it's okay, then it's good. And if he says it's bad, well, then it's wrong. Some people might create their morality um, around the Constitution. So they might say, if it's legal in the Constitution, according to the government, then that is good. And if it's uh, illegal, then it's bad. And my morality comes around the Constitution. Some people may have their kind of their own internal um, moral compass. And they might say, well, you know, I just want to be a really nice person. And that's a little nebulous, but they just believe, you know, if it feels good and if it's helpful to others, kind of the golden rule, well, then that's moral or immoral. Um, and for me, I've thought a lot about it, and I really think that my morality is um, tethered to uh, human fulfillment. So I really believe that uh, I want to live a fulfilling life and flourish as much as possible without hindering or hurting anyone else. That's the decision that I have made. And in order to live a fulfilling life um, and make sure that people who are around me live a fulfilling life, uh, it's really complicated. It's very complicated. Because there's about 99% of the world which you should not be paying attention to, <laughs> and only about 1% of the world we should. But all these things are being put in front of our faces on a daily basis, which feel good in the moment, whether it be um, watching too much TV or social media or adult films or uh, you know, gambling or, uh, or too much drinking, too much alcohol or bad food. There's all sorts of things that are tempted in front of us. Um, and there's uh, only a few, really a few basic things we should be doing to be living a fulfilling life. So the reason I've spent so much time on that is to help me distill what are the things we should be focusing on to live a fulfilling life. And 
based upon your journey thus far, what have you discovered are those things? There are, um, so I, I run now a uh, real world community and life school completely dedicated to human well-being. So we've looked at the school of longevity. So there's a lot of uh, uh, people around the world who are actually researching longevity, which means how do you live a longer, happier, more fulfilling life? Uh, ones of, no, of note are the Blue Zone study, uh, and then also the Harvard study of longevity, which has been going on for 80 years. That's one place we've looked. The other place we've looked is toward positive psychology. Uh, Victor uh, Maslow started that back with a man's search for meaning in the 1950s. And from that, there's actually now a school of psychology, which basically says, how do we live happier, <laughs> healthier? And there's a lot of overlap between longevity and positive psychology. So we've identified a number of practices um, based on those two schools and based on scientific research on how to live a more fulfilling life. So here are um, some of them. Now, most of them people know the problem isn't knowing them. The problem is doing them. Mm. So here are some of them. <laughs> the first one is living a life of purpose. And that is doing something that is not only satisfying to you, but is actually meaningful to society. So what is the role we can actually fulfill to society on a regular basis? I was just listening to your uh, podcast with Zach, and he was kind of nibbling around the edges uh, around this concept of purpose. Like, what, he was, what was he doing? And it wasn't until he found his podcast that he found his purpose, um, for example. Uh, another one is belonging. Uh, we are tribal uh, beings. Uh, every single mammal on the planet uh, is a social creature. Well, except the honey badger. The honey badger clearly does not care, but the rest of us mammals um, are social <laughs> creatures, um, and we need people. We need that. So we need other of our, of our same mammals. Uh, and what has happened because of our modern success society. Uh, we've kind of have built our own little fightums, our own little castles, which are isolated from everybody else. We have these mobile isolation chambers called cars, uh, which keep us apart from anyone else. And then we have these technology devices. Uh, technology is at its worst when it's keeping us from having meaningful conversation with the first person sitting next to us. And it's at its best when it helps us connect. And more or less, our houses, cars, and technology are doing a terrible job uh, of helping us connect to fellow human beings. And people are suffering from what I call isolation sickness, uh, where they actually get so lonely, they believe they don't need people anymore, and they have incredible anxiety whenever they go into a social situations. So we need belonging. We need to have a tribe where we go, these are my people, I belong here. We also need calm, uh, which is meditation. Meditation, uh, for very good reasons, is making a massive upswing in our society. So we believe in meditation too. And it's not just meditation. It also is a decision away from anger. So, you know, when I was younger, I used to kind of revel in my anger. I would get stressed and mad at a driver and I would curse and vent. Uh, now I don't do that. Uh, I really believe um, what gets fired gets wired. So if you're constantly firing those angry emotions and angry physicalities, that's getting wired in you, and it's really bad for your health to have a high anxiety. So calm is about lowering, making decisions to lower anxiety, which includes how you handle anger, stress, and also meditation. Uh, we also believe in sleep, and sleep has been the enemy uh, for most people um, for decades. Uh, so we also teach healthy practices around sleep. Um, diet is, is critically important. There's about a million different diets out there. They all contradict uh, except on one key fact, and that is sugar is really, really bad for us. So keeping away from processed food and sugars is kind of the core of our, we have a very, very broad diet plan, which is increase lean meats, um, fruits, vegetables, seeds and nuts. That's, that's increase those as much as you possibly can and decrease processed food. So we're fairly broad on that because there's so much disagreement on the best diet plans out there. Uh, and we also uh, believe in empowerment. And, and you, you, in societies around the world, they don't have to worry about empowerment, but here in the United States, we do. Uh, empowerment is living a life by your own design. And unless you um, are somewhat trained um, and strategically making decisions about your life, you are living somebody else's plan or are living by accident, which is usually not too healthy. So those are the practices that we teach uh, as a way to live it, living a more fulfilling life. So... How do you then tie them all together in 
and implement them all because just because we know them that's that's not good enough i mean we uh, i mean based based on my opinion i believe we have to actually implement those things yeah you're right so for us what we've discovered the best way to do that is in peer groups so you have accountability among peers so uh you know everything we do is voluntary and so when we get new students together and groups together uh they basically describe their life as they want to be they describe the things they actually want to take on right then. And we don't make them do all eight practices right away. We may have them focus on three practices. We get them up with uh, accountability buddies uh, and then they go to work. Um, but everything is done uh, by choice and agreement. And I, I think probably one of the best things we've learned from the School of Behavioral Economics is creating consequences uh, for yourself when you don't live by your practices. So, you know, I've got a uh, practice every day where I meditate for at least five minutes. That's my minimum. And I rarely go be going for 15 minutes or a half hour. Uh, and when I don't do that, uh, I've got a painful consequence for me. Uh, I have to make a donation to a politician I really dislike. So I, I've only missed that one day and I had to man, uh, go online and send him $10 and then receive his emails on a regular basis. And knowing that I have my name associated with that politician causes me a great deal of pain. Um, so I don't want to do that again. So we like creating, uh, we like to have people create their own consequences. No one's putting a consequence on anybody uh, to motivate them, make sure they're doing the practices that are most important to them. And then pairing them up with the buddies is a little bit fun. So when, you, when did you actually hammer down these eight and you're like, all right, these are the eight. This is it. No more, no less. These are the ones. <laughs> Great question. We probably did that over the last four years. I've got a really good re research team. Uh, we've been there's been so much great data just in the last four years coming out uh, on both longevity and positive psychology. It wasn't hard to find uh, between the two schools the overlapping ones that made most sense for our society. The only one that's not in their book um, that we had to put in there was empowerment. Uh, our society, um, you, it's, it's an aggressive society. Um, and unless you are fending and taking care of yourself, uh, the state, the government doesn't do a very good job of that. Um, so in many other cultures around the world, empowerment is just not an issue. And that was the one we really had to tie in uh, for our Western world. So, so is the idea that we want specifically with empowerment, because it seems like that is like y'all, it seems like you curated the the seven and those were kind of the overlap from the research and then the empowerment was no this is this is so important to us we have to put it in here we do right so so let, let's actually dig into that a little bit more what's sure. where is that coming from i mean why why in in this country versus other countries is is there yeah. do you think that we yeah. lack empowerment all right, good question. So the United States has a very strong uh, individualist, individualist uh, ethos. As a matter of fact, we're probably hyper-individualistic, and more or less anybody who cannot take care of themselves is labeled in our society a deadbeat. Now, that's not my word. I'm just saying what society says about anybody who can't take care of themselves. Uh, that's how we label them. In other countries around the world, they have a, a much more collectivist model for taking care of people who can't take care of themselves. And in any society, whether we're talking about ours or a socialist system, there are always people who don't pull their weight. There always are in all societies. It's a certain percentage of people who do not pull their weight. But by and large, the vast majority of people who are unable to take care of themselves are elderly and children. That is the, the majority statistically uh, in our country and around the world. However, we still have applied it to more or less everyone in this country. If you're not able to take care of yourself, well, too bad. You got to pull yourself up by uh, your bootstraps. That's our mentality. And that's been fermenting over the last hundred years because of our personal development ethos. The prosperity doctrine was huge in influencing that. Ayn Rand was also huge in influencing that. Uh, our politics has been huge in influencing that. That more or less is um, our mentality. So to counteract that, we really have to teach people empowerment. Empowerment is living a life of your design, and that is actually cultivating power. And power to a lot of people seems uh, like a, um, uh, a swear word, like, you know, I don't want more power. I don't be power hungry. Here's what power actually means. Power is the ability to achieve intended results. That's it. The ability to achieve intended results. 
So no matter what you want to do, if you want to buy a bigger house, buy a bigger car, get a better job, those are all exercises in power. If you want to have another extra week of vacation and go off with your spouse on vacation, that is power. If you are immobile and have to use a walker to move around and you want to be mobile again, that is an exercise in power. So everything that you want that you don't currently have, even if you want to be able to read better or read more often or spend more time giving charity, everything is an exercise in power. And what I've discovered in most of the people who uh, possess the least power is by and large, they've given up even trying. So they don't have visions and dreams anymore for things they want. They stopped even trying. They're usually just kind of living to live uh, without even trying to transform. And that's the first challenge for us whenever we work with new people is to get them thinking in the area of possibility again. What is possible for them? What could their life be like so they can even get inspired? Then we start to give them the tools so they can actually achieve uh, the life of, by design. Do you think everybody wants, like everybody wants that? Everybody wants to get more power in their lives and, and they want to have these goals and dreams and ambitions and whatnot? I don't think so. No, I, I don't think, I think most people have kind of given up and resigned themselves to the lives that they have. And they oftentimes uh, create a um, kind of excuses uh, around why their life is the way they have and they don't want to move anymore. And it's very possible, by the way, that someone could be satisfied. No. The truth is, is that, you know, having, having more stuff and sometimes uh, I, don't, I don't want to confuse power with amassing more things because things really don't make us happier. The research is very, very clear on that. And if you were to spend $5 on buying a trinket or $5 giving it to somebody else, $5 giving it away to a homeless person will make you feel better than buying $5 of the stuff or 50 or a hundred. Uh, spending a, a $5,000 on a on a new couch or a new uh, new furniture or spending $5,000 on a vacation, the $5,000 on a vacation will make you far more satisfied. Experiences are far better than things. Um, so, But it's also possible that somebody has everything they need. Because really what satisfaction is about is a lot less about having. It's a lot more about doing. And it's those eight practices. And as long as you're doing those eight practices and you have your basic necessities met, which means a roof over your head, uh, food, health insurance, uh, transportation, uh, it actually is not about doing much more than that. So happiness is just about those practices I listed earlier. So as you're on your journey and you're working on yourself, I mean, that's the whole person, the, the whole idea of personal development. And you've gotten to this point and we've talked, we've talked a little bit about it indirectly, but I want to ask again, I want to ask directly, what have been some of the most important lessons that you've learned along the way? Um, so, you know, so much of personal development is uh, about self-awareness and understanding how you are. Um, Oftentimes, life moves so quickly, it's hard for us to see our impact on other people. And we're unaware of the wake that we're creating as we're moving through the world. Uh, and that's been probably the most revealing part to me. Um, I was, uh, I've got ADHD, and I also have uh, what's called ODD, which is Oppositional Defiance Disorder. So uh, as a student, it was really hard for me um, sitting in classes. I had a hard time sitting in classes and still do. Uh, I was also incredibly defiant of any kind of authority figures. I just wanted to say no, no matter what. Uh, I don't think I really became aware of those two things until I was probably in my 30s. I wish I had learned it in my teens. Would have made school and my first jobs a heck of a lot easier versus just rebelling for the sake of rebellion. I wouldn't have known why. So that was a big part of my journey with learning um, those things. Uh, you know, another big part of it was letting go of um, resentments. So uh, I was uh, abused as a kid, both physically and verbally. Uh, I carried huge resentments, which really, resentments are, are disempowering thoughts. They really are. Resentments hold you back. They give you reasons um, why you can't be the best person you can be. They're emotional baggage, um, and they undercut who you can be. So the first part, first five or 10 years of my um, personal development 
was releasing um, my resentments, mainly uh, toward my mom. Uh, I was in so incredibly angry with her in my uh, up into my twenties. Uh, now I have nothing uh, but compassion and, and love for my mother. Uh, I think it's next to impossible. This is a well. I'll, I'll say I believe this. I can't say I can prove this. Uh, I believe this. It's really hard to be, if not impossible, to be a fully functional, mature adult if you are still harboring resentments toward either one of your parents. Uh, so that was a, a big part of my growth was uh, dispensing of all of that and getting to a place of compassion. Um, and then also you kind of begin to learn uh, about your leadership style. Uh, I uh, was nicknamed um, by my brothers, uh, the Ram Rodder, Ram Rodder, because I would ram rod through whatever I wanted, which caused a lot of resentment, a lot of pain. So a great deal of my development and my leadership style now uh, is learning how to still have all of the drive to get things done. I got huge entrepreneurial drive. I started three or four businesses, um, but doing it now in a way that uh, still get engenders cooperation versus engendering uh, resentment. Toward the leader. So those are very powerful. Um, and, and I want to touch on the resentment piece first, because clearly I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and but but there's n absolutely no way for me to fully understand the experiences that, that you had and what that was actually like to go through the process of releasing that resentment. Um, so what was that actually like? I mean, what was the process of, of recognizing, wow, this is this is holding me back. This is not allowing me or I'm not allowing myself to be the, the greatest version of myself because of this thing, this, this resentment. And what was that process of actually letting that go? So at first you, you go through the intellectual exercise of understanding um, the power that resentment has over you. And most people, once they realize they've got a resentment, it doesn't take them long to realize that resentment has some degree of control over them. And it's usually a negative. The reason it's so important is because of, um, in order to be uh, have more power, in order to be more empowered, uh, you have to have what's called one of the first steps is absolute responsibility. Now, responsibility is about knowing who to blame, who's at fault for something. However, absolute responsibility is not that. So, absolute responsibility is not um, the blaming part of it. Absolute responsibility is taking ownership of the situation as it is now. So um, I, I'm quite confident that I was not the one who abused me when I was a kid, verbally and physically. Very clear on that, not my fault. I, I was a kid, I, was, I just had to endure it and get through it. However, what I have absolute responsibility over is how I dealt with it. So when it was in my 20s and I was angry and hurt and emotionally volatile, I had to own that, the result of it, even though I didn't cause it. And until you can own the situation as it is, you cannot change it. So that's the first half of the intellectual exercise is just to get to that spot where you realize that you have pain and anger. The other person who did it to you or the situation or the government or the organization who caused that pain hurt is not going to make it right. <laughs> and almost every victim in the world realizes that they're not going to get the apology. Probably. They're probably not going to get the apology. That person's probably not going to come back and you know pay for their therapy and make it right. It's probably not going to happen. It might. There are some you know, some circumstances where it does, but it's probably not going to. Uh, and then once you actually own the situation, you're empowered to change it. And there's all sorts of exercises that you can do, um, from journaling to going to therapists to uh, personal development courses. There are some wonderful uh, places around the world. Uh, the Meadows is out in Arizona. They do really great what we'll call inner child work, which is what we're talking about here. We're talking about releasing resentments toward your parents. Uh, the Hoffman Institute, um, uh, Northern California is another one. Uh, we do some of it very lightly in Thrive Union, but we're not. We're educational more than therapeutic, but most likely organizations like that who got deep-seated hurt and trauma, childhood trauma, those are the places, those are the places you go. So now that you have learned those lessons and you know again I, I was asking what are the most important lessons um that that you have learned at this point what questions do you still have about yourself um 
you know, I, every once in a while, I'll, I'll learn a new topic. Like, you know, five years ago, I learned a lot about alcoholism and um, codependence. Uh, I don't uh, have an issue with substances, but I took a deep dive into it to learn a lot about it. Because most likely, um, if you have ten, you know, ten people, one of them has an issue with uh, uh, chemical dependence or alcohol. Uh, so I went and learned a lot about it. I kind of learned a lot about that. I learned a lot about codependence. I had some codependence behaviors. And I thought, gosh, I figured this one out. I'm no longer codependent. And that's the last thing about me that I need to learn. <laughs> then uh, a couple of years goes by and I uh, take another course. A couple of years ago, I went to the Almond Clinic out here in um, California and they did a spec brain scan on me. I did a spec brain scan and they came back. And what's really great with the Almond Clinic is they not only show you the physical structure of your brain, but they show how the physical structure of your brain actually creates your psychology. Uh, and then from that, I learned I had PTSD. Oh, that's why I have such a hard time regulating my anger uh, and why anxiety is so incredibly bad for me. That's why I have memory issues. Believe it or not, the anxiety was causing memory issues as well. And then that was another thing for me to learn and take on. So, you know, <laughs> there, there's no shortage of growth areas <laughs> in life. The one that I'm working on now uh, is on leadership. And as I run now a large volunteer uh, core, uh, getting people to do things uh, for the organization for their reasons is a, a never ending challenge. Uh, and that's the one that I'm currently working on now. Uh, plus I'm a parent. Uh, that is every single day, uh, a new hurdle, every single day. There's not a day that goes by that my kids don't throw something at me that, uh, uh, requires me to uh, move like Neo in the, the Matrix and try to figure out <laughs> how to handle it every single day. Um, I'm, I have a wonderful, spectacular wife and a growing relationship. So there's always growth there. Oh, there's no shortage uh, of things uh, to learn and grow upon. No shortage. Everyone, every, every time I think I'm done, uh, there's something new every single time. Every time. I couldn't agree more. But, but that's kind of the fun of it, right? Yeah. I mean, we're yeah. never, we're never done. never done. There's always a new challenge, a new, yeah. something exciting to, to tackle and take on. Good to hear more. So, you know, one of the most important, I've got a couple of master values uh, and the master values, which means are operational values for me that, you know, they're really important. Uh, and one of them is humility. My definition of humility is a little different than the textbook definition of humility. And humility is to be able to look at yourself objectively and admit when you're wrong. Um, and to me, humility is a master value uh, because it's really hard to grow without it. So uh, I am willing to look at myself, both the good and the bad, the strong and the weak, uh, admit when I'm wrong. Uh, and I really believe the best measurement of humility is the speed at which you can admit you're wrong. And I want to admit I'm wrong instantly so I can apologize, reconcile the relationship, if there was an error in another relationship, uh, and then make changes in myself so I improve. So that's a really important value for me. So uh, I'm so I'm so glad the conversation went this way because I think about this a lot. Let's say you you are in a situation where you may have done something or you know may, maybe you didn't even realize you did something but some, but the other person took offense to it or they got their feelings hurt or something like that and you recognize now that they have their feelings hurt but to you, it's like, but I really didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. yeah. But then they, but you know that it can be solved very quickly and easily if you just say, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But like, it's almost like it's, it's almost like your, your, your tongue is glued to your mouth to where you mm -hmm. just can't, you, you, just, uh, you just can't get it out. You can't say it. What's right. going on there? What's, what's, <laughs> what's all that about? Oh, it's, it's, it's most likely pride is most like what it is. And there's also an element of what we call boundary enforcement with that um, as well. So let me share with you a scenario that happened between me uh, and my daughter. Um, my daughter is 16 years old. Uh, she showed me a skirt and I said the skirt was small and uh, it was small. <laughs> it was physically small. That's all there was to it. It was small. And she got incredibly upset and she said, I can't believe you said it to me. And I said, but the skirt is small, small. She said, no, you called me a whore. I said, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> this is the mind of a 16-year-old girl. <laughs> so clearly, <laughs> I did not say that. <laughs> Would never say that to anybody, ever. It's a horrible, terrible thing to say. 
Um, and I was trying to explain it to her, I said, but she was still incredibly hurt. So what I then went into is I realized it was necessarily rational. And she's, you know, as her father, I'm going to figure in her life where she's looking for approval. And she saw my labeling of it as small as being some kind of judgment value versus just a stripper on the spirit. And I pretty quickly realized that. So I really stopped. We're kind of moving around and stuff like that. I really stopped. Uh, I looked at her as she was kind of um, emoting a bit and stuff like that. And I went into empathy. And empathy is to care about the feelings of somebody else's more than your own and just for a minute. It really is to put yourself in their shoes. So where I could have gone, and I did go briefly, was, what are you talking about? You are insane. But that is completely not helpful in that right. scenario. Right. Just not helpful. So I went into empathy, I stopped, I put my feet on the ground, I looked at her and just really listened to what she had to say. I asked some more questions and they weren't questions to make her wrong, they were just questions that she feels. And I said, you know, Piper, I'm really sorry if I made you feel that way. Uh, I absolutely positively would never put that label on you. I think you are a, the best kid in the world. Uh, and we were able to put it behind us. So I apologize more for how she felt um, rather than what I did. Uh, and that's how uh, I, I didn't want her to feel justified in thinking that her father called her, called her an awful word, but I didn't. <laughs> that's a great example. And so, so then as like a, as like a kind of a tangent, ex maybe not a tangent, but like to, to keep going with that, because I think this is, this is really fascinating. What happens if, the other person is, however, operating from a place of insecurity or, or unhealthy behavior. And let's say they then want an apology. And in some way, it could be where, and I'm not sure if, if, if it is, but maybe that apology almost reinforces that unhealthy mm -hmm. behavior. Right. And, it, and it's like, then right. you're giving up your power. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then it's like, it's almost like playing into to, to that game. Yeah, you know what, what's going on there. How do you how do you unpack that one? You know, it's exactly right. So in that scenario, uh, my daughter wanted me to vindicate uh, this unhealthy thought that her father would demean her by calling her whore, um, which I wasn't. And I, so I didn't want I want to validate that. So I am absolute with you. Uh, the best solution in that scenario is to empathize and empathize longer. <laughs> mm. So it's to sit down with them get them to lower their anxiety and ask them lots and lots of questions so they can act it for themselves, but you can't do it in an argumentative way. If right. they are in an excited state where they are defending and angry, you will not get to the place where they can actually recognize and own their side of that conversation. So sometimes you have to say, okay, I'm really sorry you're feeling this way. Would you mind if we came back to it uh, later tonight or tomorrow. I, I do want to talk about it more, uh, but I got to go do some stuff right now. We'll come back to it later. And then later, what you want to do is unpack it enough through asking enough questions that they can come to own their side of the equation where they can basically go, oh, you know, I guess I was really just tired. And I kind of felt hurt earlier when you didn't buy a mini milkshake. And, you know, the truth is, I know that you would never say that. That's what you want them to get to. But unfortunately, you telling them to say that doesn't work. Most people have got to come to that of their own accord. Which can be very frustrating at times. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I actually think where a lot of people get caught up, including myself, by the way, I, you know, I, I'll be the first one to say it is when that happens, getting into the spot of like, I didn't say that or, mm -hmm. oh, my God, how could you think that I think that or, you know, mm -hmm. something. Right. And then it, and then you start to get defensive and then, mm -hmm. you know. You're both just kind of crying and nobody's actually talking or having right. any sort of communication. Yeah, that <laughs> that is so that is. Let doozy. me give you one more technique whenever you're receiving feedback. So whether it be someone's telling you about you or giving you feedback on something you did to them that you, you think is misconstruing is the mid analogy. So someone is talking at you and they're coming at you aggressively. Now, what you normally want to do, both verbally and also physically, is you want to try to 
defend. You're going to have a heightening state of anxiety. You're going to be like pushing back. You're going to kind of buttress against what they're saying. And my suggestion is don't do that. So first of all, recognize you don't have to defend yourself. That whatever their experience of you is their experience of you. And usually if you think that, well, I'm going to argue their point away uh, and then they're going to like me more, that's not usually the case. Hearing them is going to make them like you more. <laughs> <laughs> so all you have to do is listen to what they say and imagine they just threw at you a baseball, a softball, and you've got a mitt. So you've got your mitt and they threw a softball at you saying, well, I didn't like what you did and you don't really care about me. And it's obvious. You take that, you put it in the mitt. And as soon as you put it in the mitt, you don't fire back. You just sit there with it just for a second and you look at it in your mitt. You go, huh, is that mine or is that theirs? Did I really do something that caused them pain and was out of lines or I violated a boundary? Or was it on their side, they misconstrued something that was actually pretty innocent on my side? Is this my issue or their, or maybe a little bit both? But if it's not yours, rather than throwing it back, you just drop it. You don't have to own it. It's not yours. Just, just let it go. So I look at every single time and I, someone's directing something at me, I just catch it with the mitt and I sit with it a minute. And if it's mine, I'll own it and make changes to it and apologize to it. If it's not, I, I just let it go. Uh, the, the phrase I use in my mind, uh, if someone's got an issue that's not really my problem, is uh, not my monkey, not my circus. Um, <laughs> that's the phrase that makes me laugh and goes, I just go, you know what, that is, or, or that's not my pig, not my farm. That is not my issue and not my domain. That is theirs and I'm walking away. So those are the phrases that I use to help me not get engaged in arguments that I don't need to be in. That's powerful. I, I feel like this is, this is really, really important stuff. And on, on like a day-to-day -day basis level of like, did the, this sort of technique in, in, in these tools, because what we're talking about are really tools with which to go about and not only understand our own reality better, but also to be able to navigate it in a way that's the most beneficial for us, right? But like being able to impact somebody's day to day, that's huge. I, I mean, I, I really think we came away with with a lot of wins here and in, in, in a lot of really powerful uh, ideas and concepts. So, um, you know, I, I want to thank you very much, Peter, for uh, for that. And um, you know, I want to be very respectful of your time. Um, well, this, I just want to say that this that my my spreadsheet I pulled uh, paid off because all the ideas I gave you today were all ideas that I've accumulated over time and put on my spreadsheet. And once you kind of um, um, cement them onto a spreadsheet, uh, they kind of get cemented in your mind um, as well. So which idea was better? Which was the better million dollar idea? Uh, how to overcome a conflict or was it the, the, the spreadsheet idea for keeping all your content? I think they're both very important. I think in different situations, they're going to be more or less valuable. I mean, as as far as like day to day working with other people, dealing with other people, conflict resolution, man, that's that's the gold mine right there. But as far as like a lifelong pursuit of growth and learning and equipping yourself with more tools and ideas to better be able to handle all of life situations, spreadsheet. Yeah, spreadsheet's good. I told you it was a good idea. I told it's you. good. That's good. <laughs> it yeah. is good. So, you know, I run a life school. That's what we do. And what, this is what a life school basically does is we give you practical tools and techniques so you can actually overcome the day-to-day -day challenges that you have. Uh, we share them when, when you interview some podcasts like this. We have classes that we do. Uh, and then we've also got a YouTube channel, uh, which where we have five-minute video essays on every different topic you can possibly imagine. Uh, and just like the content delivered here today, I try to deliver, deliver very practical, content-rich ideas uh, on, on a regular basis. Uh, and that's, uh, if you go to YouTube and search for Thrive Union, uh, you will find our Life School page, and we have got videos on every topic you can possibly imagine. I actually just listened to Metacognition this morning. So oh, yeah? uh, if y'all are, if all are uh, looking for one to get you started, that one's, that one's pretty fun. So I'd, I'd suggest checking that one out. Um, but, uh, yeah, absolutely. But, uh, Peter, you know, I do want to thank you very, very much for, uh, coming on the show today and, uh, having this conversation with me. It's been very special, very meaningful. So I just want to say thank you very much. Thank you for having me. That was a great interview. Really enjoyed it. Me too. Me too. I have one more question for you. Then we'll wrap it on up. But what question 
should I be asking you that I just wouldn't think to ask? If um, I think you're asking, this is a good question. Uh, ask um, if you could wave a wand and place a thought or an idea or a change into every man, woman, and child on the planet, um, what would it be? It, what would it be? Oh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to ask you first. It's my question, so I get to ask it first. One idea in everybody's mind. That's a really good, that's a really good question. I think it would be something centered around, you know what? I, I know what it is. I would truly wish that everybody on the planet could take more of a long-term approach to their lives and to everything that they're doing. And instead of like, for example, take a, take a long-term approach to your health. So make better health decisions for your life. Take a long-term approach to your finances. Like start educating yourself, understand how finances work, start, you know, saving and investing and, and, and building your income and, and set, start doing that earlier on, you know, emotionally uh, physically, intellectually, spiritually, relationally, all you know, all the disciplines of life. Think about them in a very long term, uh, with a very long term perspective, so that you don't do anything today that's going to come back to bite you later on. So you don't burn bridges today of people who could be, I mean, really important people in your life later on. I mean, I talk to so many people on a regular basis and I'm so grateful for that. And one of the things that I hear most often is the things that were the, the, the what is most important at the end of life are the relationships, the deep meaningful relationships that we have at the end of life. So instead of, instead of being at the end of life and wishing that we had done more relationship building, wishing we had put forth the extra effort, I wish people could have that realization now really early, early on and start taking that long-term approach to everything that they do, because I think it would lead to significantly happier and more intentional and just better lives for everybody. And when we're all living better lives and we're all happier, then there could be peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. What your, what personal development basically does is it gets us out of the habit of reacting all the time to situations, which oftentimes create really bad habits for us and have really bad effects. So personal development gets us operating more in the prefrontal cortex, which is executive function, which is thinking about long-term consequences. So when you have an emphasis on personal development, personal growth, like you're suggesting, is people start doing behaviors every day <laughs> that have better consequences over the long term. That's a great answer. I love that answer. So what's yours? Uh, I would instill the morality of fulfillment uh, in every man, woman, and child on the planet. So rather than operating from a place of um, personal um, personal enrichment, I think we're I think it's a lot of people's morality in this country is around personal enrichment. So if it makes them money, it makes them happy, then it's good. And if it doesn't, it's bad. Uh, I would have people thinking about personal fulfillment. How could they live the most flourishing life possible without injuring or hurting anybody else? I would instill that thought in every person's mind on the planet. And how did you come to that conclusion? That fulfillment most likely is the very best um, moral concept. Yeah. That, yeah. And I think that I kind of went through um, rationally uh, and looking at all the moral constructs, uh, whether it be a religious construct and what you know, a deity may have said, do and don't do. Um, I've looked at the Constitution, which does a really good job for governing a country, but not governing people, people's lives, that is. Because, uh, you know, we can look at um, the philosophy of personal enrichment, and we can certainly see what that's getting us right now, which is a country that uh, is largely isolated from one another. We can't solve political problems. We can't even agree on what reality is. So the philosophy, uh, the morality of personal enrichment is certainly not good. So I can't find a better one. When you look at what fulfillment is and flourishing is, and people living uh, Filling lives, it's kind of hard to argue with a better lifestyle. Um, yeah. So I'm still open. All my beliefs are temporary pending new information, every single one of them. So that is my belief for right now. That's the best moral construct. If someone's got a better one, uh, I'm all for it. Let me hear what it is. 
Me too. I would love to know. In fact, whenever anybody has an idea like that, I would love if y'all could either tweet it at us or comment on this or somehow let us know so we can talk about it because that would be super interesting. So anyways, yeah. Peter, thank you so, so much. I am uh, so grateful that you came on the show. Uh, to everybody who's watching and listening, I love y'all. Y'all rock. Y'all are the best. And I will see everybody on the next episode. Take care now.